I like that thought of Jesus even knowing what it feels like to hit your thumb with a hammer. <laughs> but I think he's perfect. He wouldn't hit his thumb. He's still human. It's a point well taken. He can identify with us in so many ways. I'm well, glad you're here this morning. Grab your Bibles. Make your way to Luke chapter 1. Our text this morning, I'm going to read in just a few moments, which the majority of, our, of this message will come out of is in that particular passage. Even though we are living at a particular time with great uncertainty, I want us to know for sure that Christmas is a reality and it is worth celebrating. Regardless of our circumstances, regardless of the times, regardless of what's going on in our individual or even corporate or community lives, Christmas is worth celebrating. And maybe it's just me, but it seems like I've noticed more Christmas decorations being put out earlier this year. And, and I've even heard more conversations about Christmas and the celebration of Christmas. I just wonder if perhaps because of what we've been going through for the majority of this past year, that people right now have hearts that are, that are longing. They're longing for something like hope, something like peace, some kind of change to happen. And Christmas is a great way for people to experience change and hope and, and peace. So in this sermon series entitled Christmas Isn't Canceled, we'll be taking a fresh look at some of the emotions and the particular struggles experienced at Jesus' birth. We know from Scripture, actually all the way back to the very first book of the Bible, the third chapter of the book of Genesis, that evil tried to stop Christmas. And even at the actual birth of Jesus, evil was trying to prevent Christmas. And evil continues to try to do so still today. There, there is this push that's been going on for several years that you shouldn't say Merry Christmas. It's offensive to other people. You should say something like Happy Holidays. Well, we're not celebrating holidays. We're celebrating Christmas. That's evil's attempt to try to stop Christmas. There's no doubt about it. Christmas celebration this year is probably going to look completely different than perhaps in years past for your family at home and even for our church here as we continue in this battle against COVID-19. But maybe that's not such a bad thing. Maybe by doing things a little differently, we'll end up having a different perspective, perhaps even a, a, a better or a deeper perspective than what we have had in days past. But no matter what, I want you to hear this. Christmas is not canceled. Christmas cannot be canceled. It cannot be silenced. It cannot be stopped. And today we're going to look at the miracles, some of the miracles of Christmas. So our text begins in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Scripture there tells us in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Father, we thank you for your word, your written word. It was spoken so long ago, but continues to speak to us even today. I pray, Father, that we would allow your spirit to be able to speak into our lives this day, to be able to hear what it is you would want us to hear from you this day. I pray, Father, as we take a fresh look at the significance and the meaning of Christmas, that, Father, it would ha- open up our hearts to, to a new way of celebrating Christmas and to a, a new way of relating, not just to you, but even to one another. I pray, Father, for lives to be changed for all of eternity. For that is the purpose of Christmas. We thank you, we love you, in Jesus' name. Amen. The first miracle I want us to look at this morning is the miracle of virgin birth. It is the one that stands out so obvious in the text. For verse 27, it said, The angel appeared to to Mary and said, To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. The virgin's name was Mary. You who are highly favored. It's a narration being given to us. Helping us to understand the situation. Mary was to be the mother of of Jesus, it says that she was favored. But don't misunderstand, she's not favored because of anything that she had done herself. It wasn't particularly the kind of life she had lived. It wasn't that she had made the right decisions or hung out with the right people or had gone to the synagogue on a regular basis or had memorized certain uh, Old Testament passages sufficiently. It wasn't that she had given to support the cause of the church or her local community. It wasn't that she was giving to other people who were in need. She may very well have done all of those things, but it wasn't because of those things that she was favored. She was favored because God chose her to be the mother of Jesus. God placed his undeserved grace upon her, and that is what made her favored. Clearly, it says she's a virgin, meaning that she has not been sexually intimate with a man. So much so that she asked in verse 34, how can this be? How can this be possible? The angel tells her in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. You know, pregnancy and birth are fascinating parts of God's creating power. For a pregnancy to occur, a female's egg must be fertilized by a male's sperm. This is what has happened for every pregnancy that has ever happened in the history of mankind. And it is what will happen for all of humanity in the future as well. No matter how much man tries to legislate or experiment or change things about life on this earth... The one thing that man will not be able to change is what God has foresaw to see fit to create man and woman, child, through the relationship of a man and a woman. However, Jesus was not conceived in that way. Mary's pregnancy was a supernatural pregnancy. The very phrase there that says the Holy Spirit will come upon you means that her pregnancy did not occur by natural means. But this would not be anything unusual for the Holy Spirit, if you think about it, because the Holy Spirit has always been involved in creation. Again, we can look back at Genesis, the first chapter, and we see there where we're told, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we see that the Spirit was involved from the very beginning with creation. God's Spirit simply speaks and it is so. 
Jesus chapter 1, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God spoke over and over again, and as he spoke, things came into being. So in other words, there, there was no form of any kind of mating between Mary and, and the Holy Spirit. There's some perverted uh, interpretations of that, and that's not what Scripture is saying here. What Scripture is saying is the Holy Spirit spoke. God chose Mary, favored her. And his power fell upon her, and she conceived. And the angel says in verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. But the miracle of the virgin birth is not only supernatural, but it's, it's crucial for our redemption. People... Sometimes wonder, is it important to believe in the virgin birth? Or why is it so important? Well, because it's, it's, it's closely connected to our redemption. Because if Jesus had been born by way of an earthly father, then he would have inherited the same sin nature as the earthly father. But Scripture in Hebrews 4.15, 2 Corinthians 5.20 on, 1 Peter 2.22 and 1 John 3.5 all declare that Jesus was without sin. You see, again, from Genesis we know that when God created man, he initially gave man dominion over the rest of creation. Man was supposed to rule creation. But in just the third chapter of Genesis, when man sinned and disobeyed God, instead of ruling as God intended, man became slave to sin, Romans 6, 16. And the result is every person born since Adam has received that same sin nature. Romans 5, 12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all Amen. So the reality is that every one of us sitting here this morning, because we have an earthly father, we inherited the same sin nature as our earthly father. But since Mary's pregnancy was supernatural, Jesus was born with the sinless nature of his heavenly father, God. Now some people believe that, that Mary was Perfect that she was sinless herself. That was how Jesus could be born sinless because she was sinless. But there's nothing in Scripture to support that. There's no indication that Mary was a sinless person. And there's no need for us to even have to try to make that particular thought fit into the narrative of Scripture. There is a theory known as the federal headship theory that explains that the sin nature is passed down from generation to generation to every person through the Father only. So that theory is given a possible explanation of how Jesus could be born of a woman, Mary, but still be sinless because he did not have an earthly father. And again, Scripture does not specifically teach that theory, although it's implied through Scripture. But I don't think we necessarily need to come up with some theory or justification to explain the virgin birth or how Jesus could remain sinless, simply because God is God. And God can do whatever he wants to do. And so for me, if God simply wanted to cause a conception for Mary, of which he would then oversee and divinely protect the baby inside of her womb from receiving the sinless, excuse me, the sin nature, then he can do that. The point, important thing is, though, is that Scripture is very clear about this, that Mary was a virgin. And so when she conceived, it led to the virgin birth. That indeed is one of the miracles of Christmas. But the second miracle 
I want us to think about for a few moments is the miracle of God becoming man. The miracle of God becoming man. Verse 31 said, you will be with a child to give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and be, be, will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Now don't misunderstand this. God becoming man does not mean that God ceased to be God. What it means is that God wrapped himself in the skin of man. J.I. Packer, in his book entitled Knowing God, said it this way, remaining what he was, he became what he was not. So you see, God chose to come to us in the same way that we came into the world, as a baby. I guess God certainly could have come as a full-grown adult. I mean, I guess God could have certainly have created this world with a stationary existence, meaning there's no infants, there's no children, there's no teenagers, no senior adults, just everybody comes to this world as a fully grown, mature adult, and that's how we remain. But God didn't choose to do it that way. Instead, he created us for growth and for development, to experience the, the stages of life. And he chose to come into this world just like we came into this world. And he experienced these stages of life as well. So Jesus is God with skin. He walked on this earth and he lived on this earth much like we do today, except he did it without sinning. He's not a man who became God. <laughs> so many religions that are in this world today teach about a, a prophet or, or a God or someone who, who became a God. Christianity speaks about a God who became man for us. You see the difference there. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus accepted the limitations of humanity, meaning that he experienced the emotions and the physical needs that we experience. Scripture tells us that he was hungry. Scripture tells us that he was thirsty. He felt physical pain. He experienced personal rejection. And ultimately he died. So he was born fully man while remaining fully God. That's an unusual birth. You look back their history and, and you look at what's going on today and it's not hard to find unusual births occurring. I just did a quick search this week and discovered a few that I want to share with you this morning. Here's a picture of a British woman named Amy Buck who experienced labor for 20 days. Not only is that an unusual birth, but it's one that I bet every woman in here says, uh-uh. <laughs> I don't have a picture of this one, but in 2000, there was a massive flood in Mozambique that forced people to literally have to climb up into trees and to cling to limbs for days until they were rescued. One such woman named Carolina, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing the last name right or not, Carenza, was pregnant when she climbed that, one, of her, one of those trees. And during her four days of clinging to that tree, she gave birth to her baby girl. That's an unusual birth. Here's a picture of two twins and their family. Their mother, Maria, gave birth to the first twin during the fifth month of her pregnancy. The second one was born 87 days later. Twins that will not have the same birthday, even not even the same birthday month. And lastly, here's a picture of two twins that were born in two different countries. The mother, Donna Keenan, went into labor prematurely while at a relative's home in England. Paramedics concerned for the safety of the second child rushed her to the closest hospital, which happened to be in Scotland. So those are unusual. And I'm sure some of you know of some more unusual 
births that have occurred throughout time, maybe even in your own life. But one thing is for sure, no matter how unusual they may be, there is no other pregnancy and or birth throughout all of humanity that is as unique and as spectacular as the birth of Jesus Christ. Because it is God coming to us. Holy God coming into our world. Thousands of years before his birth, the prophet Isaiah spoke and said, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. It was always God's plan from the beginning. And we know that Emmanuel from Matthew 1.23 means God with us. It's always his plan to come to us. So it's the miracle of the virgin birth. It's the miracle of God coming to us. And one more I want to share with you this morning. The miracle of timing. The miracle of timing. Galatians 4.4 says, But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. You see, Jesus didn't come any earlier than when he did come because it was not the right time. The verse said, when the time had fully come, or at just the right time, God sent his son. So Christmas is the miracle of Jesus' birth at just the right time. We're concerned about time. We're concerned about the right time. We oftentimes wait for the right time to to mow our yard. We wait, wait for the right time to uh, buy a house. We wait for the right time to start a family. We wait for the right time to begin a new project. Bless you. We wait for the right time to study for a test. That's tomorrow morning. We wait for the right time to start a diet. Just as God provided for our greatest need at just the right time, God meets all of our current needs at just the right time. So many times we're waiting for the right time, and we fail to realize the time is now. We wait for the right time to start going to church. We wait for the right time to get baptized. We wait for the right time to join a church. We wait for the right time to start reading our Bible, the right time to start tithing. And the time is now. When Jesus was born, most people didn't recognize the importance or the significance of his birth. People then didn't get it, and honestly, people are still not getting it today. His birth was not a coincidence. It was planned from the beginning. See, here's the truth. God's timing is always perfect. (laughs) Romans 5, 6 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. God is never late. By the way, if you walk into the worship service late and you see me in the back, you don't have to say anything to me about being late. You got here at the right time. Early for next week. It's great. We're concerned about time. God is not in the sense that he wears a watch, but he is concerned about everything happening according to his plan. And so his timing is always perfect. He's never late. He always shows up at the right time. But he continues to meet our needs today in the right time as well. And sometimes that means having to wait. We don't like waiting. But it's to our benefit to wait because at the right time, when he meets our need, we'll be far more fulfilled or satisfied than we ever would have been if we attempted to accomplish it in our own time, in our own way. 
I just want to say if you're listening to this message today, either in person or online, if you've not made a decision to choose to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then this is the right time. It's a decision that you can make today. Maybe you weren't even thinking about that when you came or when you started watching, but it is the right time. Faith in Jesus Christ means believing that he will give you exactly what it is you need at just the right time. And I want you to think about this. Scripture tells us that God has been planning from the very beginning for the birth of Jesus Christ. And we have every reason to believe because Scripture tells us and confirms it that he is also planning for the right time for his return. He came as a baby. He will come as a king. And it will be at just the right time. Verse 38 is Mary's response to this most unusual announcement given to her. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. What an astounding assignment. I wonder if God would have appeared to any one of us with that kind of news. If we would have been like Mary and, and, and responded, well, if you say so, then I believe it to be so. I wonder if we're even doing that in our own lives with the news or the announcements or the visions or the plans that he's already revealed to us even at this point. You see the faith that Mary had. The miracles that were before her, she simply believed. There doesn't appear to be any conversation other than her first pointing out that one question, obvious question, well, how can this be? Since I'm a virgin, to which the angel answered and she said, okay, sign me up. Do you see the faith that was in her heart? Do you see the openness of her heart, the, the willingness to, to trust God for, for whatever it is he wants to do, but to allow him to use her in any capacity, in any way that he chose fit to do so? Can you say that of your heart today as we prepare to celebrate Christmas this year? She fully submitted herself to the word that was given to her from the Lord. What's your relationship with God like today? How would you describe your faith? Can God give you an impossible or what appears to be an impossible assignment and can he count on you to believe him? God is still choosing to show his favor upon people today. We're seeing it right here through this church. I hope they don't mind me using them examples this morning, but I, I want to point out some obvious ones. I, I believe God has shown his favor on, on Jody Stuckey and a team that's working with him to begin a ministry called Faith Riders. And God is reaching people, drawing people unto himself, and God is glorifying himself through that particular ministry because their hearts are willing to, to believe that God wants to do something through them. And how could I not mention this one, that God has shown his favor on Todd and Lawanda Davis and, and Sandra George and chosen to use them to birth a new ministry through the life of this church called New Life Transition Ministry, a ministry that is drawing people to the Lord and, and changing lives, a ministry that is bringing glory to God, a ministry that I will celebrate an open house this afternoon. You're invited to come, by the way. See, God is still speaking into the lives of his people. And he's choosing at certain times, at the right time, to place a vision, a, a plan in the hearts of his people because he wants to do something. Just, well, I want to say just like when he came. <laughs> it may not be quite as spectacular. But he wants to do something to fulfill the ultimate purpose, which is to bring people into his kingdom. And he wants to do that through our lives. 
So I ask you this morning, has God shown his favor on you? Has God given you a vision in your heart for his glory? Has God been calling you to start something? It may not be an actual ministry. It may not be a ministry started through the life of this church. It it may be a ministry out in the community or maybe going somewhere else even. It may be in missions. It it may be a, a ministry that will be more focused on your mission field at work or school students or even in your family. But he's placed this in your heart and he's placed this idea, this vision upon you. And it may not have been something he's given to you recently. For some of you, it may have been something he's given to you a long time ago. But you have been putting it off because you're waiting for the right time. And what we need to understand, when God gives us a vision a plan, an initiative, (laughs) it's the right time. When God God calls a person unto himself, a person he wants to, to come into his eternal family, it's not so that the person would be saved sometime in the future, it's so the person would be saved then. It's it's the right time. God is revealing himself. That's what Christmas is all about. God coming to us, to mankind, to reveal himself to us. So I close with this. As our worship team comes up, God is still choosing to reveal himself to others to bring glory to himself through the lives of his people who have available hearts. God is still choosing to reveal himself to others and bring greater glory to himself through the lives of his people who have available hearts. Would you join me this morning in prayer? Oh, fathers, for your glory that you came to this world, and it is for our salvation that you came into this world. Jesus' virgin birth was necessary in order for Jesus to be the one who would die for our sins. Father, thank you for coming for us, for not giving up on us or abandoning us. If you had, you truly would not be God. But in your love, at just the right time, you demonstrated your love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And in return, Father, you ask us to to die for you, to deny our lives, to surrender our wills and our way to follow you. Because you want not just our lives to be in your life, but you want to work through our lives so that many others can come to know you as well. So Father, for those of us in this room who our hearts know that you've given us a vision, a plan, an initiative, but we've been putting it off. May we find this morning the courage from your spirit to renew our commitment to you and to fulfill what it is you want to do in and through our lives. To recognize that your favor is not shown upon us because of anything we've done, but it is your undeserved grace placed upon us. For the sake of the lost and for your glory. May we respond to you this day. If there's a heart in this room or listening online that is ready to make a decision to to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, I pray that that's what we've made today. Right where they are, they just begin to pray and say, God, I want to be saved. I want Jesus to be my Lord. Please forgive me of my sins. Help me to begin new life in Christ today. For others that may be joining church membership, maybe to begin attending church or giving to the church or serving with gifts and abilities whatever it may be may we faithfully respond to you this day as you call upon us in Jesus name amen would you stand this morning this is your opportunity to respond